Ladies and gentlemen, friends and fellow travelers, a very warm welcome to this afternoon session. It's a great, great pleasure and privilege to welcome here uh, Eduardo Terrazas. Uh, I would like to give, first of all, a few thank yous. Um, actually, the first thank you goes to the late uh, Luis Baragan, because it's actually in his house that um, I worked in the early 2000s together with Carrie Thuin Evans on an exhibition which we co-curated. Uh, and it's in this context that for the first time I saw uh, a painting actually by um, Eduardo without knowing that it is by him. Uh, but it is really thanks to um, Baragan that that first contact zone happened. Uh, I would like then to thank very much Julie Bukopsa, who is here with us today. Um, she's very much at the origin of this conversation because actually um, she was one week before me in Sharjah and I got this SMS, urgent, urgent, that there is this incredible um, revelation of uh, uh, Eduardo's work with his wonderful room in the Sharjah Museum. And we have to thank you also who are Al Kazimi uh, for having made all of this uh, possible? Because it is really the Sharjah Biennale, which in a very major way made us all rediscover uh, Eduardo's work uh, uh, internationally. As always, I would like to thank Claudio Vogt for the wonderful organization, and of course, uh, Mark Spiegel, Annette Schönholz, and everybody else at Art Basel um, for the wonderful ongoing dialogue. And obviously, this idea of doing interviews with pioneers, with artists and architects. Um, who have made major contributions over many decades has always been part of the Art Basel conversation. So, for example, last year we uh, you know, interviewed uh, pioneering uh, members of the Zero Group, uh, for a similar generation of Eduardo uh, in Germany. And uh, without losing more time, I'd like to actually start immediately with the first question. And I um, wanted to ask you, Eduardo, if you could tell us a little bit about how it all started, because we had a wonderful lunch today. Uh, and discussed epiphanies over lunch. And you told me that your first epiphany was actually a liberal family in Mexico. Yes, I, <clears throat> I was very lucky to have parents and the whole family structure was very liberal in the outlook to the world. So they were not afraid of, of being in Europe or being in the United States or being in any other place and and understanding the elements that were at stake at that time in the in the world. This was just before the Second World War, which I think it was a very important time. And then uh, a second uh, epiphany has to do obviously with architecture, because before you encountered art, you encountered architecture. And you mentioned uh, a Japanese house before as a very early epiphany. Yeah, this was uh, a work I got to supervise a Japanese house that was built in Mexico by Barbara Hutton, a very rich lady from the United States who decided to build a Japanese house. And we brought all the materials from Japan, the kawara, the towel from the, the hinoki, the one, the bark of the things. And I learned there how to build, how to build, because in architecture, you have to know how to build things, how you put things together. The tatamis, for instance, is a fantastic discovery. The tatamis is the module of the rooms. The modules of the floors come as gives you the module of the size of the room. Anyway, so that was knowing how to to put things together, wood, the Japanese houses are very much of wood, and uh, anyway, that was my first encounter with uh, the Bienetre de la Construcción, And that led then to other epiphanies, which have a lot to do um, with traveling. And uh, I think it's kind of fascinating very often. David Hockney once told me that we often in life need to make a detour you know, to then discover actually what really matters, or even to discover ourselves, or our own culture, our own context. And you clearly made many of such detours and went on to many travels. We spoke about your time in Rome. So can we talk a little bit about this travel epiphany? Yeah, well, I decided after First, I decided that my finishing of architecture in Mexico 
at the school of our, at the university school was not sufficient that I needed to see more of the world. So I had a scholarship to go to Cornell University and did a master's of architecture and I had two great professors. That was the epiphany. There was Alan Solomon who was the creator and the art critic of the pop artists which when I arrived to Cornell University in 1960 there was already an exhibit of the bed of Rauschenberg and and for me, those things were mind-blowing because they were, at that time, I had never seen those type of work and the, the relationship. And having been explained by Alan Solomon, the whole thing, not only that, but the history of art of it, every epoch was great. I had another professor which influenced me very much. He was an architect. His name is John Haydock. He became the director of Cooper Union afterwards, and he was a great, he had, he saw architecture in a very ample vision of architecture, which we need to have more of that type of vision of architecture. Yeah, and also a vision which goes beyond the, the boundaries, of course, of, of disciplines and uh, we talked about Kepesh, you know, this idea of uh, going beyond the fear of pooling knowledge, which seems to be a very much in the core of your practice. The idea from after Cornell, I decided not to go back to Mexico, going again, what you were saying about the retour. The re re and I went to Rome, and I lived in Via Babuino, which was parallel to Via Marguta, which was where all the galleries of modern art were exploding. And, uh, and from there, I was invited to go to Leningrad to, put a, to help assist the director of the exhibition, an exhibition of pre-Columbian art, colonial art, modern art, and a big room with crafts. And there, it was probably my greatest epiphany, I understood, I began to understand Mexico. Because once you're outside and you see it back from the outside, you understand a little bit what is happening with Mexico. And there's obviously a, you know, a very strong amnesia always about curatorial history. And you know, a few years ago, I interviewed you know, Walter Zanini, who made such a major contribution to you know, Latin American curating with his early Sao Paulo Biennials. And in Mexico, the curator who inspired you uh, was somebody also today not very well remembered called Fernando Gamboa. And I was thinking in terms of you know, the necessary protest against forgetting, it would be nice today that we remember Fernando Gamboa. Maybe you tell us a little bit about what inspired you about him in relation to these pre-Columbian shows, which also marked the first encounter you had with Hui Cholo and many other important kind of uh, more uh, old influences from you know, Mexican art. Well, Fernando Gamboa was the first one who, in 1952, had the first idea of putting a pre-Columbian art in London. So it was to present Mexico at the time after the Second World War, we needed to become, to put Mexico at the stage of the world, at the scenario of the world that Mexico began, that Mexico begins to be known from internationally. And, and Fernando Gamboa was super in that. He organized exhibits that you cannot believe the, the exhibits. It was before the, the Museum of Anthropology, so we had a lot of the pieces of the Museum of Anthropology with us, and we had to carry them and put them in pedestals, and it was uh, very exciting. Now, another key influence is this encounter uh, with Team 10, and that's particularly interesting. Uh, uh, I've met mo most of the members, uh, like Giancarlo De Carlo, for example, Ralph Erskine, um, and uh, they, of course, also the Smithsons, Peter and Alison Smithson. And it was a, an architectural movement which very much resisted the sort of more homogenized kind of modern architecture which would just be applied all over the world and try to emphasize again 
the local, try to emphasize local needs and local necessities. Can you tell us a little bit about that influence and your sort of whole connection to Team 10? Well, I think I was, my professors in Mexico had kind of taught me that the necessity of an architect was to, to help the country become a nation, a great nation. So it was a social concern be, being an architect. It, it didn't have anything to do with the firm, the author. It was the, the thing that you would do so that the country would become better. And uh, the, the Team 10 had exactly the idea of becoming local, <coughs> applying concepts of modern art, but in a local way. For instance, Le Corbusier did Chandigarh, in, which is the capital of the Punjab, but he did Chandigarh as he would be doing it in, for people in Paris. And the Team 10 was not very happy with that. And uh, so that influence of the Team 10 and the whole relationship of those architects there were Bakema, Aldo Van Eyck, mm. uh, Peter Smithson, were all very concerned with that idea of uh, not that, that the result of the architect should be social concern. And that leads us also to uh, actually, uh, because you certainly all wonder why we have this image here of the <laughs> Olympic rings, uh, which is soon going to change because we're going to start the images uh, Eduardo brought for us to look at, and uh, it leads us all to Ramirez Vasquez, because Ramirez Vasquez, I met him with Pedro Reyes, the Mexican artist, about 15 years ago, because Pedro said, you know, it's urgent we go and see Ramirez Vasquez. Uh, maybe we can dedicate today's talk actually to the memory of Ramirez Vasquez, who died a few months ago. He was in his 90s um, and uh, uh, was a very, very important Mexican architect who, as you told me earlier today, always had these considerations for social dimension of uh, architecture. And it was your, your whole traveling came to a quite abrupt end when all of a sudden you were in New York and you got a phone call from Ramirez Vasquez and he called you to actually come well, back to Well, he had Mexico. sent me to New York. Yeah. He had sent me to do the Mexican Pavilion at the New York World's Fair. And then suddenly I received a uh, telegram and a phone call from him, come back to Mexico, I've been selected as the president of the organizing committee for the Olympic Games in Mexico in 1968. And we have to create a, an image of Mexico which is modern and great. And that is, again, the, Ramirez Vasquez had it very clear what it had to be done. So he went to the president and told them that he should let us do whatever we thought it should be done. At that time, cost didn't meant too much, extra hours. Everybody put themselves the T-shirt of Mexico, and uh, and everybody worked very happily. And now this is obviously a, a dream situation because if you think about such you know many moments in the earlier 20th century, you know, when Mayakovsky describes this idea of squares becoming pallets and, you know, the sort of idea to work really on the scale of a city. Here, you could all of a sudden work on the scale of an entire country and, and uh, it was like, almost like a social sculpture, the urban design, the whole graphic concept. And maybe it's the moment to look at a little bit more at the, at the slides because it is one of the great projects, the dialogue between you know, Ramirez Vasquez and you produced among the most extraordinary, uh, here we go, things. And maybe we can start with the logo because obviously the logo is the key and angle point of it all. And I was wondering, because a few years ago we had here in our Basel uh, actually uh, the inventor of, uh, of LSD, uh, Hoffman, and he uh, uh, then described to us the day he invented, you know, LSD. And uh, I always think that leads us back to the epiphany. I've always been wondering what happened the day this logo, this incredible logo, was invented. Can you tell us about the process? It seems to be it's a collaborative process. Well, it's a very simple process, actually. It's just a dialogue process 
to put together the Olympic rings together with the circles of the six and the eight has and put them together and forming a geometric form. And then from this geometric form, we began thinking, what should we do with this geometric form? And then my knowledge of having worked with Gamboa in Leningrad and in Warsaw, in Paris, with the craft space that all the crafts of Mexico were done, I remember, and I bought a little piece of uh, the Huichole. The Huichole is an etnia who lives in the north of Mexico in the mountains of Jalisco and Nayarit. And they do their works. They don't do this kind of work. They do works that are related to their cosmovision, yeah. to the peyote, and to the deers, and to the sun, and to the things. But not, nothing related to that. So my idea was to relate modern art with the concept of craft. And, uh, and they understood it very well. They understood it very well. And uh, we began the Mexico 68 became the, um, the geometry of the 68 with the parallel lines, then came more parallel lines until you got to the next, to the parallel lines of the whole thing. And all of this was inspired on a little, put the little. That's the inspiration. That's inspiration. And that's a piece you collected. You, you had that piece that you I had it and it got lost. <laughs> <laughs> and that was before, obviously, you collaborated with your cholo artists. That comes later. Yes. That's, at that moment, it's an appropriation. It's you an appropriation. It. Yeah. Uh, I decided that the important thing was to appropriate Mexican crafts because they're still alive in Mexico. There are a lot of people doing crafts in Mexico. And they're doing them very fine. And uh, if we could appropriate them well, I think uh, a lot of things can come out from them that would become fantastic. Now, I have this Instagram project that I post every couple of days, a handwritten note by an artist or an architect or a scientist kind of joins in this protest of Umberto Eco against the disappearance of handwriting. And you wrote this wonderful sentence before, which connects to that, which is craft is needed. We're going to put it on Instagram you know, just after the talk. Um, and I wanted to tell, ask you to tell us a little bit more in this context why you think you know, for the 21st century craft is, is needed. Well, I think people have forgotten to think with their hands. They just move their hands like in the internet and things like that. And to do this work, to do this yarn work, you have to, to be very careful that it's very well glued together because it's a piece of wood that they put a wax on top of it, the wood, and then they glue the yarn on top of the wax. And uh, so you're beginning to think with, a, with your mind, absorbed, it's like... Uh, meditation about what you're doing. And uh, I think uh, craft is very much needed in our times. The idea of craft, whatever it is, the idea of thinking with a, not exactly doing the same visions that the, that the indigenous people have because they have, they use it for that, but to use their ability to do that. And the chain is really a beautiful chain. It's almost, a, as Philippe Areno would say, la chaîne est belle, because then, you know, from this appropriated thing, you continue to work and more and more amazing things popped up. And then we decided to put colors on the symbols of the Olympics 
it was not a, an intellectual, systematic approach to colors. It was a systematic approach to give each sport a color. And that, I think, has changed very much the it changed very much the way graphics were done. And so it wasn't a color theory in an eaten or kind of Alba's kind of way. It was more or less random, you said before, or random. chance attributed to, yeah. Completely random. But it was See. then applied very, very broadly. No, I mean, it was applied on all levels. It, it was applied to the stadiums. It was applied to the tickets. Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, millions and millions and millions of things were printed. It was really a very For widespread. For instance, you say, oh, what beautiful colors they are. And they were, how they are combined in a, such a fantastic way. And they're not combined consciously. They just came out because, can you give me the one before? Yeah. These were the symbols of the stadiums and the symbols of the seats, which those are the two th things that you had to identify. And once you identify those things, you put them in the ticket, and you could enter to the ticket and find out. You would know which side would be. The Olympic Stadium was yellow, and the seat that you were seating it was A, B, C, D, and then, give me the next one. And you see, that was the yellow. The yellow was the stadium, was the big color on the right-hand side. The Stadio 68, that was the Olympic Stadium. And the seat was orange. And it wasn't limited just to the seats and to the stadiums because um, actually, you mentioned before that Göritz did this Rua Amistad. There was a whole 17-kilometer-long uh, parkour of, of sculptures. It really uh, it was very pervasive. No, the entire city was transformed. No, and I, which I didn't bring the, the view, I color all the structure of the city, what you were saying, all the structure of the city, all the main avenues of the city, which is 20 kilometers long by 20 kilometers wide, at least. I put yellow on each post of the, of the 20 kilometers. And you were in the yellow avenue, and you were in the red avenue, or you were in the pink avenue. Which was, again, the first time you used color to identify the streets. Yeah, and it's fascinating because we had a couple of years ago, you know, Edi Rama presented his theory here where, he, you know, the mayor, the then mayor of Tirana changing the city through color. He said it's a form of urbanism, no? The city changes by introducing color. And what happens here? Because it's a whole symbol also, no? I mean, I read the book, there's this wonderful book which uh, Ramirez Vasquez and you um, did, which is basically about this uh, Olympic uh, uh, saga and, and um, uh, the symbol language is something we haven't spoken about yet. Well, it's again, there was a big cultural program on the Olympics. We decided, Ramirez Vasquez thought it would be a good idea to have a cultural program as the Olympics, the original Olympics in Greece had a cultural program and a sports program. And there hadn't been any cultural program in the Olympics, in the modern Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was the cultural program, the symbols for the films, exhibitions, music, ballet, folklore, dancing, etc., etc. And they were all in black and white, so not to mix it with more colors. Anyway, and there's much, much more information on this book. You should all get this book. It's an incredible book because there's obviously many more chapters we can't go into now because of time. There are the memorabilia. It's really very pervasive how this project happened. But then at the same time, 
it's a moment of serial invention in your work because it's not only the Olympics, but then also you started with these balloons and the balloons um, are something which I think we should also talk about in this conversation because I think it reminds so many things which happen in contemporary art now and I was thinking it's incredibly interesting, for example, in relation to Thomas Saraceno and, you know, and many artists who work with such balloons. Now, can you tell us what triggered these balloons? What was, uh, because it was again an appropriation from craft somehow, no? Well, yeah, definitely. Balloons were, the, the, there's a, a saying of the, of the president of Mexico, he was giving a speech on the main square of the Mexico. And suddenly a, a man that was selling balloons escaped the balloons and went up and everybody began turning around. Ah, look at that, ta, ta, ta. And the president turns around to the audience and says, Pueblo Globero, <laughs> your uh, country of globos. You're only interested in globos. And I was interested in globos since I was a kid. My parents used to buy me a globo every Sunday. They were the Sunday salesmen of Globos. We had the biggest factory of Globos this size in the world. In Mexico. In Guadalajara. Wow. So Globos is a, it's a must. But then you started to develop a whole language with them because you started to also, I mean, it's so great is that you started to combine them into all kinds of clusters and constellations almost like balloon cities. It sort of reminds me almost of, you know, some Yona Friedman drawings or some Metabolis drawings. They become almost like, you know. Well, th this is what I'm saying that we have to be near craft because this is just the evolution of craft in, into, into our modern mm -hmm. times, to our modern times. The first one, the first one was uh, a presentation that Harper's Bazaar needed to a presentation for the Olympics. And they asked me to do a, a presentation that would be extraordinary. So I decided to do a balloon of 10 meters high. And the people could go inside, the models could go inside, and the photographs would be from the inside looking at the cathedral. And other kind of unrealized projects, I was suddenly thinking, you know, uh, because this reminds a lot utopic architecture, do you have unrealized projects, balloon cities, or, or even in your other work, projects which have been too big to be realized, dreams? Well, I... Mexico City, as you all know, it's a very big city. And uh, my concern is that we don't call them any more cities mm -hmm. because Mexico City, Toluca, Cuernavaca, places that you probably know, Puebla, is part of Mexico City. So we have to be a concern of space, that space becomes a different dimension. Yeah, you mentioned that here because I want to ask you at the end of the conversation, but we should do it now because you mentioned space, because on the way here we pass by this oversized watch, which is in the you know, lobby of the Ramana, and you said, um, looking at this watch, we should talk about space and about time. Yes, because time is the the only machine that has been invented, super invented, and it's the one that controls the world, the financing of the world, the financial aspect of the world, and, uh, and we need to have a different, which is a very interesting idea, but we need a concept of space that dialogues with this concept of time. Mm -hmm. And you think that's unrealized? Is that an unrealized project? It's not, it's an unrealized project because it has not been discussed sufficiently. 
So that could be a great topic for our bigger conference. We should do this. Could be exciting. But then back to realize things. Uh, obviously, well, this idea of applying your, your, your patterns and, and on a bigger and bigger scale, and with the Olympics, it became really on the scale of a country, led also to things like the stadium. Can you talk about this? Well, this is, an, again, an appropriation of the crafts in Mexico. The, this is, there's a village in Mexico called Huamantla, where they paint the main street of Huamantla where they put the Virgin in a procession and they paint the whole street with dust, colored dust of the wood. Mm -hmm. All the carpenters save the dust of the wood and they color it. Mm -hmm. And then they put yellow and all kinds of color. And it looks fantastic. And I decided, why not for the stadiums of the Olympics, but with a modern design. And this is another thing which connects to, um, to Mexico 68, because actually in 68, there was also, we mentioned Giancarlo de Carlo earlier. And for me, it's one of the most exciting exhibitions of the 20th century. It's the Triennale Giancarlo de Carlo did for uh, Milano. Uh, it's a moment where all the radical experiments of architecture of the late 60s were brought together with incredible spaces of, uh, from Hans Hollein to, uh, of course, Archigram to Team 10. All of these you know, architects did uh, experiments then, and this very radical exhibition was actually stormed by the students, because it was also the 68 moment, uh, and never really open to the public. It sort of happened at the opening days, so it's an exhibition which became very legendary, but an exhibition which almost no one but the participating artists and architects saw. And you did for this 68 moment uh, in Milano a, a project which is it's almost like a kind of a a complete installation. Can you tell us about, about this? Because it, it connects a lot to your Mexico 68 design, to the logo. Well, it's a kind, I call it a total space in which you design the roof, the walls, the floor, and the elements of the, the architectural elements become the letters and the rings of the of the logotype Mexico 68. So again, I don't use the usual way of designing architecture per se, but I take the letters themselves as architecture. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it has not been done very much. So it's kind of a Gesamtkunstwerk because you, you use the space and you use the ceiling and you use the floor. Uh, and it leads to a complete immersion. Can you tell us a little bit more about this immersive uh, For instance, quality? this thing on the left-hand side, we put the memorabilia of the, we open a, a space to put the memorabilia, the pens and the pocket books and the crafts that were done for the Olympic Games. And uh, at the, in the back, you see publications that were done for the Olympics. Give me another one before. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this is in none of the books. It's, a, it's a, incredible. If you have, we've never seen this before. Can you tell us about this? Well, I cannot tell you too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is... We did fashion for all the girls that were the hostesses to all the teams that came to compete on the Olympics. And the hostess had to host people in Acapulco because that's where sailing was being done. So they asked us, can you design a, a bikini for us and a cape? And so we designed them that way. So it, it, this really has to do a lot with consistency and knowing what you can be consistent, until what extent you are consistent. And where do you break the randomness? Mm -hmm. Where do you use the randomness? And it's also interesting because obviously you couldn't have gone broader. I mean, there was this, this famous, um, Sentence by the Vietnamese General Jap, uh, which uh, Mario Merz often quoted, you know, when you, when you gain territory, there is a risk of losing concentration. And when you 
gain concentration, there is a risk of losing territory. And I was very fascinated that after this experience with the uh, Olympics, where you really could design on a scale of an entire country, and there was nothing you, know, you didn't design. It was basically fashion, it was uh, graphic design, it was the streets, it was the squares, it was the plaza, it was television, because obviously the whole broadcasting happened within you know, your designs. And that uh, sort of just after this experience, there is a moment of extreme concentration, because it's the moment of the tablas, it's the beginning of the tablas, exactly. which is much, much more, I wouldn't say subjective, but very concentrated. So I was wondering if you can tell us about, because this is the first, Tablas here, 72, if you can tell us about what prompted this epiphany, if it had to do maybe with a desire well, of Well, I decided that I needed to begin doing my own work. And uh, I invited a, a Wichole, an Indian, we call them Indians, it's not a pejorative word, but to come and live in my house to see how they would do the yarn. And I would trace them, I would trace this thing and see if they could follow the, because this is wood, as I said, you put wax, the wax is of a tree called Cera de Campeche, Campeche tree, wax, and, uh, and it's transparent, so you can see what's on the back. So I could trace them, this geometry, so this geometry was done usually in drawings this size, and then I would trace them in bigger, in bigger boards, and uh, and I decided to do an exhibition at the Palace of Fine Arts, which was a friend of mine was the director of it, <laughs> and he said, "Well, I won't." I won't do it until Tamayo comes and sees your work. So <laughs> Tamayo came and approved it. And so the show happened. That was the first um, time. In 1972. Those, those tablas were seen, the year you invented them. I and mean, one of the things I'm interested in is also, um, Alighiero Boetti always talk, told me about this idea, you know, when he did his uh, arazis, his uh, embroideries first in Afghanistan and later in Pakistan, about this strange zone of negotiation that, you know, how much is their instruction? and how much freedom does one give uh, in such a process of actually, you know, delegation? Uh, and obviously here, uh, it's a similar question I was asking myself. Is it something which you precisely defined and what's the range of interpretation there was for the person who worked with you and for you to actually do it? Well, it's a kind of a precisely yeah. interpretation. They precisely in interpret the drawing I have made. But I tell them the, how to do it geometrically and with T squares and with, so they learned how to do it. They understand the logic because the logic of it is each form is, you can see for instance the, in the green in the middle, you see some lines like that that the yarn is done that way, that way, that way, that way, that way, and the turning of the yarn is what creates the superstructure of the lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the lines are, I mean, you once said in an interview that the threads are both the lines and the brush, which I think and is, the brush. is very beautiful, no? And, uh, and the light, yeah. because the light becomes if, if, the, if the threads come in this direction, the light hits it in one direction and it comes and you can see a kind of a three-dimensional object in some of the works. Yeah, it very much oscillates between two uh, and three dimensions, no? Yes. But what is interesting also, if one looks at the book, because you start at tablas, but then another structure sort of sets in and that's an almost infinite structure, you call it the possibilities of a structure. It's sort of simple geometric structures and all these possibilities growing out of them. And like the tablas, it connects to the cosmos. Can you explain to us this really key concept in your work of the possibilities of a structure? Well, I did, the, this is a possibility of a structure 
this structure, you can do, you can continue working with this basic structure. I have 153 drawings of made with this structure, which are totally different. And is the main square, the diagonals of the square, the perpendiculars of the square, and the celestial dome, that's where the cosmos comes into. Mm -hmm. And you can think of it a little bit symbolically as the day and night. There's an article on, on the book which uh, Spanish wrote it. But there's also a reference to Da Vinci that actually it all starts, all these possibilities starts with the dot. With the dot, exactly. Because, and all the possibilities start with this structure or with another structure or, but it starts with a dot. Here we have more possibilities. These are the different possibilities that you can get from the original possibility. And this is another whole ball game which uh, tells you organic growth. Organic growth, we grow the organisms grow to number eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this same structure is repeated in nine, 10, 11, 12, but the, it has the same structure from nine to 16, but the colors of the little triangles are different. So it's through diversity that organisms grow. We are almost, all of us have almost the same DNAs and things like that, like the chimpanzee or ourselves. And, uh, but what makes us the difference is the different DNA, DNAs, how they work together. Now this is part and it's also exhibited here uh, in Basel, so it's maybe, it's I think important to talk a little bit more about the context this work was born, because there is, this moment actually of um, a codex, uh, it's, it's in 75 that you were actually invited to do this publication for the Club of Rome and you distinguish the exponential growth and at the same time the organic growth. The exp I mean, this is the uh, or organic growth and I think there's somewhere the exponential growth. That's the exponential growth. The exponential growth, you grow by numbers and nothing stops. Four, 16, tan, 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 tan until you arrive to black. And the other one, at eight, you began diversifying. And in this one, no. And one of the problems of our world, that's what, there was a book called The Limits of Growth that the Club of Rome did in 1972, which was that we are growing, everything in the world is growing exponentially. It's growing with a curve that goes up to the speed, antibiotics, the power of, uh, of explosion, Every, the, the, the human population is growing that direction in the year, in, the, in this century, at the end of this century, they think that we are going to be nine billion year nine billion persons. And we had actually Binswanger here, the legendary uh, Swiss um, economist in dialogue with Tino Segal two years ago and um, the conversation touched exactly on that. I mean, he was talking about this idea of the limits of growth and uh, the necessity of finding a, a, a limit. A in limit. The, in the growth. Yeah. Because you, we cannot continue growing that way. It needs to change, it needs to have a different attitude, a different vision of the... And this is why these two ways of playing with geometry is... I'm saying things with geometry. 
But it's not only these geometric works which are to be seen you know, in the context of this Club of Rome project from 75, but there is also the actual report which you did, which is an incredible publication, which includes a lot of uh, statistics and once more shows your, uh, in, your capish kind of pluridisciplinary <laughs> practice because you're an urban planner, you're a designer, you're an artist, but you're also, in this instance, a sociologist because there are lots of statistics, demographics, it's about you know the the the, the, the age, age 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 of the population. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this report because it's pinned on the wall and it's a kind of a um, a very uh, interesting rendering. It's a visual rendering really of the data, no, of the uh, of the Club of Rome. Well, there are the different uh, statistics of a lot of things that are have. For instance, there is one in between that they compare speed the speed that we're having, that the world has had, the speed since human kind was invented or born, could go at a speed of three kilometers, three miles an hour. By the year 1800, the, with the Industrial Revolution, with the Watts uh, invention of the vapor, and then the vapor boats were invented, the speed began growing very fast. Then there came the airplane, the proper airplane, then the propulsion airplane, and now the jet airplane, and now the Sputnik the one that took the people to the moon and for the first time they could see the moon, they could see the air as a global planet. And then we have this image here, which is uh, um, actually in the center of, uh, of the exhibit. It's uh, this image you found of this Bikini Atoll atomic uh, explosion. And if one actually stands in front of it, the thing which is so incredibly uncanny is this door. You don't see it very well here in the, you know, in the slide, but on the right-hand side, there is this door, and it's almost like a door into, into an abyss. Can you tell us about this extraordinary image? Well, I think this image, the nuclear energy, we're not talking of the atom bomb. I'm not talking of the atom bomb, and not of disasters or Hiroshima or Nagasaki. I'm talking of the nuclear energy. What's nuclear energy and what is it going to be doing to the world once we discover really what are the things of nuclear energy? CERN is very much, mm -hmm. they're trying to find, it's the next experiment. This was the experiment that the Americans did to see what happened and CERN is, the second CERN is the one that is in between Geneva and I consider, or my hypothesis is that two ages, the black frame is modernism, modernism, and the white frame becomes the contemporary global era, which we don't know where we are going to go. This, in 1946, is the threshold. And that leads us to, we've got two minutes, as Claudio, so that means two very fast questions. Uh, one thing is, you know, in the build-up also of the next panel tomorrow morning, where we're going to talk about farming and, you know, the artist as a farmer, um, I found in the research, and you mentioned the future, you know, in the research, a lot of things you said about the ruralization of the urban. There's a limit of growth, but you said there is also a limit to do, and there is a ruralization of the urban, uh, which was a seminar you did in the late 60s. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, new ruralization? Because I think it could be interesting in relation to tomorrow. Well, the new ruralization is, has to do with, uh, I don't know, 75 or 65 percent of the grains mm -hmm. that are grown in the world are for animals, not for people, mm -hmm. not for the hunger of people. 
So it could become something, if we change this way of, Einstein said that that little formula explains to you why we all have to be vegetarian. <laughs> Einstein said it, eh? I didn't say it. <laughs> And in terms of the future, you know, I was also thinking, obviously, about the future of institutions and, you know, your idea of changing the world and, you know, what you said to have always a social impact. Now, you have been thinking a lot, uh, and it's something which is strong in Mexico because it's something Pedro Reyes was always telling me that, you know, there is obviously Goritz's idea of, a, you know, an artist-run museum, but you have also been thinking a lot about this idea. How could an institution work which has a social impact on the world? Where do these reflections stand now? How do you see the 21st century institution? Well, I, need, I think we need much more a multidisciplinary way of thinking. Mm -hmm. We need economists that are sitting down there, and we need to discuss with that. We need scientists, and we need a lot of things, politicians. And because the world became very compar compar com departments of knowledge. Pam, 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 pam. And it's not more open. You know, it's like Leonardo, mm -hmm. his favorite thing was to do fiestas of, uh, for the kings of, of France. He was hired to do the lions that opened the mouth and so it was a much more broader view of the world and the interrelationship of those things I think something will come out of it. And that very much ties beautifully in again with this Tino Segal Binswanger conversation where they said you know uh, obviously and Tino Segal works now with uh, also with Olafur Eliasson and inventors of solar technology on this idea of a solar airplane this idea that we need to pull all the knowledge no, from all, all the, the disciplines knowledge. to solve the big question. Very last question Eduardo there is a beautiful little book uh, by Rainer Maria Rilke, which is an advice uh, to a young artist. And there are many young artists here present, you know, in the audience, I was kind of wondering what would in 2013 be your advice to a young artist or to a young architect? That they understand or try to understand because nobody understands it very well the world that we're living on. And because from that, the works of art would have to come out. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much, Eduardo. Thank you all very much. Gracias. <laughs>